I'm McKinney Smith. After going through a divorce, my sister passing away, experiencing narcissistic abuse, and some significant health scares, I realized through sharing my story that I wasn't alone in my suffering. Suffering, subjective distress generated by the experience of being out of balance. In a deep dive to holistically heal mind, body, and soul is where I discovered peace, clarity, and connection. It is impossible to be truly wise without some real-life hardship, and we cannot develop post-traumatic wisdom without making it through, and most importantly, through it together. Social connection builds resilience, and resilience helps create post-traumatic wisdom, and that wisdom leads to hope. Hope for you and others witnessing and participating in your healing, and hope for your community. A healthy community is a healing community, and a healing community is full of hope because it has seen its own people weather, survive, and thrive. Thank you for joining us on the Heal Her podcast, H-E-A-L, Honor, Elevate, and Love Her podcast, formerly known as the Iwaka My Stilettos podcast the top 1.5% most popular show globally where we have conversations with extraordinary women on their journey toward wholeness and harmony. And since you're already here, you may as well subscribe. As a certified mindset coach guiding women towards peace, clarity, and connection within, supporting the direction of the system toward wholeness, my goal here is to help you thrive. Alicia Breeze is a content creator, preacher, singer, and coach getting you spiritually free from narcissistic abuse, oppression, and toxicity of all kinds. She's the host of the live broadcast, Shooting the Breeze. The show educates and supports many through their journey out of toxic and abusive relationships with an emphasis on narcissistic abuse. Narcissism has been the show's focus since its inception as she explores narcissism through God's word and equips people with biblical tools to break free naturally and spiritually from narcissistic abuse and toxicity. She also offers support to her followers through daily prayer on her Instagram page called Pray and Slay Every Day. Inspired by her own challenging experiences of exiting a narcissistic abusive relationship of almost 20 years, she was led to help others to work through these difficult circumstances, giving them practical and spiritual tools on their path towards total healing and renewed relationship with themselves and God. It is through this journey of healing that she's become an emerging voice of hope and expertise on this subject. So please welcome to the show, Alicia Breeze. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Alicia. <laughs> Hi, Alicia. This is like a long overdue conversation for this podcast. Yeah, I was saving this for the first, you know, the beginning of 2023. <laughs> I said, you know what? Let's start it off with a bang with McKinney. So I'm so happy to be here with you today. Thank you so much for not only agreeing to have this conversation, but I know that the work that you do has helped myself and many others. So I appreciate your energy. I appreciate your wisdom. I appreciate all the light that you bring into this world and that you've used to help us to shine our own light. So thank you. Well, listen, you don't get me emotional right now. (laughs) Thank you so much. What an awesome intro. And you know what? It goes both ways. You've helped me in so many ways and you've helped so many in our community. So God bless you for that. So thank you for having me once again. Thanks. So I know this conversation is going to be fruitful and exciting for the listeners. You and I were chatting before we hit record and 45 minutes passed and we're like, whoa, oh yeah. (laughs) So... So we've got lots of good stuff for the listeners. So before we get to where you are presently, I'd love Mm -hmm. to start at the very beginning and get to know who Alicia was before we knew who Alicia was. I would love if you could share with us, what did you want to be as a little girl? And what were you like as a teenager? Oh, wow, girl. (laughs) Well, listen, believe it or not, as a little girl, I was extremely shy. Can you believe that? (laughs) I was very quiet, very introverted. I came from a a kind of like a 
a really ambitious family, daughter of a, an amazing woman who was one of the first Black broadcasters in Canada with CBC Radio, for anybody who's familiar with that in Canada. My father was a businessman um, in the medical field, a dentist, you know, went to private school, had a lot of privileges, you know, um, for myself, you know, and uh, growing up with like very academic background, like my brothers, my sister, all this type of stuff. I, you, you wouldn't think so, but I began to feel very small <laughs> mm-hmm. that I didn't really measure up. And so, you know, I became very introverted. But, you know, as time went on, um, you know, I realized that through going through some trials in my academic history, I went to, was diagnosed with a, with a learning disability that I didn't quite understand, went to like a special school where they called it the special school, right? With um, other, other kids, but only maybe three or four kids for about four years. So my social interaction was limited, not having an opportunity to really flourish in my personality. That was a struggle. But um, going into high school, I came out of that system. I actually got in one of the top um, girl private schools in Canada at the age of maybe 11 or so. And it was like, hey, I'm smart. <laughs> what are you doing all this time? There was no, back in those days, your parents aren't conversing about what's really happening, why you're in certain places. So I was always in my mind trying to figure out why am I here? Why aren't I like the other kids? And then all of a sudden I passed this exam with flying colors and they're like, hey, she's, she's turned. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know what I was diagnosed with to this day. And you wow. know what? It's so crazy because it goes to so when you're labeled a certain thing, mm. right? Sometimes it's a good thing, but sometimes it can work against you because you can use it as a crutch. Mm-hmm. So I went on to, to high school. I rebelled. I got heavily involved in street culture, hip hop culture, which I still love to this day. I don't care, preacher or not. And <laughs> um, and uh, it really formed my identity, even just being a, from a diverse background, connecting to me to my Black history, that type of thing. My culture, my West Indian background, made a lot of friends, grew up really in the, in the budding culture of music industry in Toronto, which then plummeted me to want to get into the music industry, so which I got into radio, entertainment, film, management, worked with one of the top management companies in the country, got internships, went to New York, all this good stuff. So, you know, all that rebelliousness and my voice started to emerge. Mm -hmm. That being said, it was a great time growing up in Toronto. It was a great time being seen like all the all the amazing talent that came out of here. So that was my passion. Music was a great escape for me. I was scared to sing, even though I was a singer, because remember, I'm still introverted. So I I tapped into the business side of things, completely different from where I was now and uh, am now, but still drawing from that experience. And then I found Jesus or Jesus found me (laughs) (laughs) in a nutshell. And then through getting, realizing my true identity in God, I think that's when I started to see the true Alicia emerge. Um, in terms of creation, um, music, singing, speaking my mind, confidence, godfidence, I like to call it. Mm-hmm. And the rest is history. Wow. Okay. So there's that's so prior much. prior to the drama. <laughs> that was, I need you to know that because that's prior to the calamity. <laughs> That came, which I think we're going to take. <laughs> well, we will definitely get into that. I wanted to, okay, so your Cole's Nose version of your childhood had so much in there that I could unpack, but I want to yeah. leave some some room for talking about the other stuff that we were going to get into. But okay, so let's talk about titles, because you said that, you know, you were labeled having a learning disability, and you didn't even know what that was, but how that affected you as a child, even how things progressed. Let's talk about that in general for people, because Oftentimes, whether it be a label of, I don't know, anxiety or ADHD or depression or whatever you call it, these labels kind of force people, like you said, to to use it as a, a crutch. How do you feel that affected you and how were you able to remove yourself from that label to now be the Alicia that you are today? Okay. Well, this is the interesting thing that I've still been unpacking even now. Um, 
being at such a young age, I went to this school. Firstly, I skipped a grade at the very beginning of, of my education. I skipped a grade. So I went into grade two. Okay. Oh, wow. So I made my, my, you know, my friends and all that type of thing. Then I was told that I would not be progressing and that I'd have to go back and go into a do grade two again. Now for a child, it's traumatizing on many levels because a, you're not moving forward with the other kids and you don't understand why then you're told, then you're taken out of a school that you were very comfortable with. And now not only are you positioned in the special school, I was the youngest, the next oldest person in that dynamic was 14 years old. Mm. So I was in a school literally with psychologists, child psychologists, very affluent um, private school for children who did have these disabilities, whether it be dyslexia. I think they, I think I'm not, I can't quote this, but they were thinking I was dyslexic in some area, even though I knew how to, the reason I skipped the grade because I knew how to cursive write. And I knew how to read, like read, but there was gaps in my education. There were gaps Mm -hmm. in my learning. I couldn't quite understand how I was seen so genius in certain areas, but in the simple things I didn't grasp. So I found that out later. So going to the school, it was very, I lived in my head because now you're thinking you're seven years old and you're around 14, 15, 16 year olds. Like that is like, okay, Mm -hmm. I like, how do I fit in? Right. Mm -hmm. Then you have that that you don't really have any peers you know you're mm-hmm. the little girl like in the classroom and I think maybe at the next year there was a couple of other kids around my age and um then you you know you're you're living in your mind you don't even know why you're there you speak to your mom and your dad and they're like you know this is your school now but why but why so the not having your questions answered from a very young age it creates a kind of like mindset of I have to, I have to figure things out on my own. Mm-hmm. I have to manage my feelings because now who are you expressing yourself to, right? And so I believe as what that developed in me was a lack of trust, right? Um, with like parental or adults. I just never. If, if I look back in my life, McKinney, I never really had, a. The, I felt more con, um, connected to my peer if I found a peer than mm-hmm. like a parent or a teacher or, because I just, my answers were never being, my questions were never being answered. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I feel like, I hate to say it, my parents would probably really scorn at this, but I feel like I raised myself to some capacity. I came from an affluent background. I went to a private school. I always had food in my belly, always had access to things, but I didn't have the emotional supervision. And it caused me to make a lot of poor choices Mm -hmm. as a young person, Mm -hmm. including losing my virginity at a very young age, not understand, like, really not have, it wasn't because I want just not knowing and hearing like the wrong people in your mm-hmm. ears, you know, mm-hmm. tell you, girl, you got to start early because, you know, if you don't start early, it's going to hurt. Like stuff like that, <laughs> like the craziest things. I don't mm-hmm. know if I'm the only one out here, but you're, you're, and then you don't have that parental voice and you ask questions and it's like, we're not talking about that right now. Mm-hmm. Or, Why am I at this school? Mom, like, can we talk about relationships? Well, what relationship? Like, there's no conversations. Yeah, yeah. You're just on your own out here. I went to school in downtown Toronto. I mean, just on the way home on that city TTC bus. You know how much interactions you're having with people? It's crazy. Yeah. So lack of supervision was huge and just having to navigate things on my own. I feel like, especially West Indian parents, their paradigm and their way of operating Um, of not communicating certain things or pushing certain things under the rug or thinking that they're sheltering their kids from things left a lot of us trying to figure things out on our own. And I think their parenting styles, I'm sure they did the best they could with what they knew and what they had in that time, but their parenting styles left a lot of us as adults now basically trying to heal the childhood wounds of not having the emotional support that we needed growing up. Yes. I guess coming from having parents where you grew up, you know, your your parents were considered successful, so you didn't lack for anything. 
because our parents are, you know, they're often our loudest critics or fans. And even if they didn't provide the emotional support that we may have needed, where did you receive your support and praise from growing up? Hmm. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, okay, I'll say this, though. You know, you have someone in your life who they were sheltered themselves. My mother was very sheltered. So a lot of the things that I partake in, it probably wouldn't have been in her mind to know, even if it was presented to her, because she was quite naive. My father is the one that I desired affirmation from, but did not get. Mm. My mother did affirm me, though. The problem with my mom, she affirmed me so much that even if something was wrong, she would turn a blind eye to it. (laughs) Like I could sit there with like weed in the house, rolling papers like (laughs) drop on the floor, and she'd be like, what? But what is that? And I'm like, it's okay, mom. <laughs> you know? Like, it was like a good thing for a kid that age. But I think a lot of times I was like, why doesn't my mom like say anything? Like yeah. I could go out. I had a lot of freedom. In the, but it's like every kid wants that. I think innately wants that, that voice to say, listen, like, to give you instruction. The Bible talks about this a lot. Like the mo- your, your mother's words are supposed to be a, a, an emblem of instruction, right? So even though you're doing something that you can get away with, sometimes as a child, you need a parent to say, listen, you, I don't, you don't need to do that. Or this is yeah. wrong. You, or you have to put a boundary here. So my mother was there. like, my mother, I could walk out with like purple hair, blush up to here, like all <laughs> my forehead. I'm like, mom, do you think this looks good? You look great, honey. <laughs> but I look back now, I remember going to our work, going to work wearing this mini skirt. I must've been 18 years old. I'm like, mom, do you think this is too short? She's like, you're a young girl, rock that skirt. So to some people that would be like, your mom is so cool. But yeah. so I look back now, I'm like, mom, you should have got me a longer skirt. <laughs> you know, like, come on. Like, now I'm like, I'm looking back at how people were looking at me at the office. Like, they, like you know, when I'm a young kid going out there. So it was like that. I wish that um, I, so when you asked me that question, it really was from the community that I created amongst uh, budding artists in this city. I'm mm-hmm. going to say it like this. It was from kids who I connected with kids who didn't have the opportunities I had. And I felt like I was a source of letting them know you can go to college. Like I always had that thing inside of me. You can go to university. I feel like I didn't get the affirmation. So it was my job to affirm others who might not have had the opportunities I had. So I had this mindset like out of my affluent, you know, rich friends, I was always a bridge towards others. Most of my friends did come from the the, the outskirts, came from, you know, the hoods of, uh, in Toronto and they accepted me and they affirmed me like, hey, you're smart. Eh? And I'm like, really? Because I wasn't getting that at home. Right. You know, I didn't know I was smart. Hey, you're really gifted in this. I would say, mom, dad, I want to sing. They're like, oh, you know, we'll teach you how to play piano. Like, I don't want to learn piano. I want to do this. So it's like ev- wherever you're fed, yeah. is where you go. Yeah. And so for me, that was in the street, street hip hop culture of Toronto. All of my friends, and I mean, all of my friends, we're immersed in that. We're going to like every hip hop un- underground show. I'm, I'm learning from DJs. I got my earphones on and that just affirmed me as a strong woman in a predominantly male kind of community. Mm-hmm. And it was dope. Like it was so good. I don't like regret it at all. It's really shaped, it really shaped me. And um, I met amazing people and I was a voice even to people in these affluent communities that would like to, you know, generalize and, and, and I'd be like, you don't know what you're talking about, you know? And they didn't like that. I mean, it came to the point where I would go to the schools and we would be reading, like, it would be black history month and all the books are about slavery in the 1800s. I'm like, can we read about Malcolm X? Yeah. What's happening here? Like yeah. my voice became so loud because there was this culture and that was pushing me. I would have discussions with my father. Like it was always, I was very into why things are the way they are. Why can't I hang out with those people over there and that person over there? 
And it wasn't a race thing. If you were cool, I was cool with you. Black, white, Indian, Chinese, it didn't matter to me. And so I find that from a very young age, I was always challenging these thoughts. And Mm -hmm. I still do it to this day. And you can you can hear the passion in your voice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <you're> <laughs> okay, so let's mm. get to what drove you to do what you're doing today. Life. <laughs> <laughs> Life experience. Um, you know, coming out of, and you read it in the bio, out of a narcissistic abusive relationship. I realize, and like many victims of it, you're you're really getting your PhD in something. You don't know what it is at the time, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, literally, the day that I left that situation, literally, I remember like lying down, trying to go to sleep, but the adrenaline was just kept me up for a few days. I'm trying to get out of that situation. And I did, thanks be to God. And I just started to write down, like I started to literally write down a list of I have to help others, you know, Mm -hmm. how was I going to do that? You know, you just write it down. You don't really think too much of it, but I just started to write it down. And it's funny because I wrote the email on my phone. I wrote the email to myself and it actually, I, I forgot about it and discovered it about maybe last year around this time. And I was like, wow, like I'm doing everything I wrote down in this list when I was coming out of crisis, you know, write it down and make it plain. Exactly. Right. And, and run with it. And, um, you know, I think my love and zeal for other human beings, male and female, that thing, like I talk about that passion for justice, that passion for freedom. I don't want anybody to experience and lose not just years, but decades of their life to something that they were not designed for. Right. Mm-hmm. And so for those of you who don't know, I was a pastor's wife for almost 17 years, almost 18 years. And, you know, I led people all the time, pastored people all the time, coached people all the time as just like, that's just the fruit of what my relationship with God was. And then I just continued. I really just continued. It's just now I had more life experience, more compassion, more understanding, because talking about labels, I didn't know what the heck I was going through then too. <laughs> Like (laughs) you see the pattern, right? When you don't understand something, that's why the Bible says with all thy getting, get understanding because you can get, 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 and Mm -hmm. never understand the the important questions that you're asking today to find out who you truly are and then become who you are truly designed to be. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's where I'm at now. (laughs) Okay. So before I ask the question I, I have in my mind, I think about, you know, when I asked you what drove you to do what you're doing today, at the end of the day, there's really four motivations that drive us Mm -hmm. to do what we do. There's Mm -hmm. fear, there's desire, there's duty, and there's love. It sounds like from what you've explained, it's like a mix of love and duty, like your your love for people and your duty to protect other people from experiencing what you've experienced. Absolutely. I see every time you speak, Makini, I'm always think the scripture confirms what you're saying, right? And there's a scripture that says, after you've been converted, go back and strengthen your brethren. This is mm-hmm. what God commands. Like mm-hmm. when, when God rescues us, blesses us, we have, it's not about a feeling. It's the fact that, that you have been connected to a greater design, a greater purpose, and that you have a job and every good soldier does not leave their post. So mm-hmm. even though through the I had some terrible experiences like many of our, our listeners today, it does not take away the assignment for your life. Yeah. And many times people give up and say, well, that chapter's closed. But what if I told somebody today that the chapter continues? There's just less characters in the story. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there, there are you have to continue because There's always a fight. There's always a trial. There's always something that will hinder you to get to the other side of what could be motivating you, which is fear. You mentioned that. That's a motivator. What would happen now if you get on the other side of that fear? And then it becomes an exciting journey. This has had to be the most exciting (laughs) movie that keeps going years after. And it's like, wow, it's it is the most beautiful. I like to say this term. It's it's like being beautifully broken. 
Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I've come to a place where God has had to reveal to me the beauty, even in the midst of uh, affliction. And he said it to Joseph. He said in the Bible, I will bless you in your place of affliction. Right. And man, that encourages me. <laughs> Because you, when you're afflicted, you're like, it's over. I know it's over. But God, really, He's so amazing that He can bless you in the land of your affliction. He really Amen. can. Mm-hmm. You, you spoke to a couple of things. So, a common theme on this podcast from everyone that I've interviewed is that their pain birthed their purpose. Yes. Right? Um, we were all able to take that pain and transmute it into something beautiful. Um, whether it be to be of service to someone else or or what have you. So I totally see that same commonality with you. Mm-hmm. And then you mentioned fear. So in the coaching that I do, that I, I learned from my mentor, like there's an analogy, but first, like a lot of us, we have a fear of something and it causes us to avoid or to stick to what we know or to go back mm-hmm. to, you know, what the masses are doing or what have you. And then you talked about like the the reward, the blessing. So it's like mm-hmm. when you are able to push through that terror barrier, everything that you desire, all the understanding and all the rewards are on the other side of that. And I had to take that training and that, you know, there's a common acronym, acronym for fear that's out there. It's false evidence appearing real. And in my first book, I talk about how I take that acronym and flip it to face everything and rise. Because everything that I've ever wanted was on the other side of what I feared, whether that be me wanting to travel the world, but being afraid of airplanes or me wanting, you know, a healthy, loving relationship. But because of my past ones, me being afraid entering into relationships, like all of these things that we are afraid of, if we work through the fear, it's not getting over it. It's working through the fear to get Mm -hmm. to the rewards, get to all the beautiful blessings that are on the other side. Like you and I were talking before we recorded about all the blessings that we're experiencing right now. And Mm -hmm. I explained to you, like, sometimes I feel like if I could bottle up the feeling of safety and love and peace and joy, if I could bottle that and sell it, I'd be a billionaire. I'll be a partner in that business. (laughs) Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing is impossible. (laughs) Exactly. 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 (laughs) Okay. So let's talk about the work that you do. Because I feel like even when we first connected, like I remember we, you know, first connected between my mother and social, but it was like on a a surface level, but we were able to build a deeper connection through our experience with narcissistic abuse. And in that process of us being able to heal and understand Mm -hmm. how we connected and how our similar stories, we were able to make an impact and help other people out of those situations. Let's talk about some of the... I guess some of the, I want to see some of the blessings that have come from the painful experiences um, in terms of like the impact with other women or opportunities or things so that the people who are listening, because I know there's always people that are afraid to share their story or afraid to be open about certain parts of their experience because they feel so alone, but you end up finding community in these spaces and it opens up worlds that you didn't believe you had access to. Absolutely. I mean, just allowing this platform, these multiple platforms. So listen, girl, I was not connected to like technology <laughs> on the that I am now, social media, especially during the COVID crisis and everything. Like it really birthed this platform on Instagram and YouTube, primarily YouTube. Now I've been working a lot with YouTube because it's more, I I feel the community a little bit. It's more very, you know, you know, when you come on my channel, you know exactly what you're getting. It's like, boom, boom, boom. Right. And I always say, listen, if you want, you need a mindset on a daily basis to get through this type of, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, like I was telling you before, it's moving into a ministry initiative at this point because, and some people say, no, listen, you, you got to do the, you got to, you know, and I'm like, listen, people give and I'm trusting the Lord 
that he's putting in the hearts of people. And he is to give into what I'm doing because I, they feel the passion they have gleaned from it and seen the fruit of it. Mm-hmm. And then understanding that this is not just a natural experience. It's a spiritual one and how to allow God to bring the best out of you to share your stories. As you know, um, a lot of stories and testimonies have been shared and we're starting up that again in the next couple of weeks. Had to even just take a break from that just to replenish. When you're getting a lot of information, you have to take time to process it and let yeah. it let it produce what it was set to produce. And I'm crazy enough to believe that those, and I call them souls, they're not just subscribers. We're really on the journey together, yeah. right? I don't care if you step in like today after this podcast or if you've been there for months, I approach everybody like we're on the same team and everybody is trying to get to that destination. I do a lot of lives. I don't do a lot of, you know, pre-edited videos because I'm just in a, I'm a real time type of person. (laughs) I I want you to feel what's happening in real time. I want to answer the questions in real time. I want you to feel the authenticity that mm-hmm. comes from serving God. And I'm not a perfect person, but I'll tell you, I'm very authentic. I'm yes. flawed, jacked up and messed up, but I'm full of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And I will, one of the things that has really blessed me on top of blessing others, it's God has given me freedom through just me, me, y'all. Like McKinney, yeah. just me, me. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like we're talking about, the, I, one of the things that has blessed me is in terms of what was a fear for me, was being rejected, being talked about. I had pride, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, I was supposed to be this in people's eyes, but I'm really this. And now I'm like, here, I'm really this. And everybody listening, you're really this too. Let's be who we are, wherever we're at, whether you're a believer, whether you're not, whether Mm. you are strung out and on drugs, maybe you prostituted yourself. Like I'm serious. Like I've talked to people who have so much shame because in the dynamic of a narcissistic abuse, they might've been trafficked, right? We see there's levels to this, right? Mm -hmm. And so my whole thing is God has sees us as all precious. And one of the greatest things is to see God's transformative power in the lives of people. I did not even know Mm -hmm. like on a social media platform, I have made friends. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have found sisters. I have spoken to men as well who, you know, leaders, I've talked to politicians, Nikini, there are so many people that I've connected with, who when I'm ready to do whatever, all I have to do is make a phone call, but I'm just waiting on the Lord. You know, I take this very seriously. I don't know what God has in store, but I'm willing to walk through the door of whatever he opens. So the opportunities has been in people. Because people are our greatest resource on this side of heaven, okay? Yeah. Not the money, not the platforms, not this. I have connected with the hearts of people. And that's my greatest blessing in all of this. Yes, I agree with you a thousand percent. We are wired for connection. And and this is what I feel like the danger of the pandemic itself. Like in isolation, we will actually die. We need each other, right? And when you are more of who you truly are, when you are being your authentic self, you attract more people who are just like you. You build your own community. You build your own support system. You build your own ministries. And it's okay that you repel others that are not like you because not everyone is supposed to be around you. You're not supposed to be connected to all different types of energy, right? So the more that you are being yourself and sharing your truth, you create this community of other people who can relate, who can resonate, whose spirits, your spirits. And I think sometimes people are afraid to share their dark, I'm going to say truths. And there have been people that may have shared it with the wrong person. You know, you share that with the wrong person and then they will dim your light or gaslight you or make you feel like there's something wrong with you. But when you are your authentic self and you are sharing that with the right people, you build a beautiful community. And like you said, that is like the greatest resource. And from one introvert to another, social media has allowed me beautiful connections with people that I may not have ever had an opportunity to connect with because I would be too shy to have that conversation with them on the road or wherever. So it's created 
you know, beautiful, beautiful connections. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the, the main thing for me, I'm, I'm still, I guess, answering that question in the sense of like the pinnacle pinnacle is when I can take or God has gifted me and assigned me to set somebody free by reconnecting them to him. Mm-hmm. Like that, has not that I'm just doing that. But when I see how the Lord uses these things, like this platform or uses the pain or whatever, because you there's healing to a certain point yeah. on this side of heaven. But then there's a healing that God gets right deep into the soul that allows you to flourish in ways that you know you can't even take any credit for. Like I could sit here right now and say, I'm a self-made woman. I, you know, I did this. There are things that you know that you can do with your own hands. But when you see God come into your life in a place where, how am I going to rebuild God? How am I going to break out of this bitterness or hatred or anger that I have? How is I, I pray and I don't see nothing. I have no one to talk to and you're stuck. And when God can come in and make unstuck and, and you step into places where you thought like, I can't, like me, I'm like, I'm serving God. What? Are you kidding me? Then you get to the point where now you only care what God thinks. Now your affirmation is not even coming from even your best friend, even your, your loved one, your husband, your wife, your affirmation now comes from God. Now that takes you to another level. Yeah. And so that's where the major life changing experience happens where it doesn't just happen here, but it, it takes you into the next life. Yeah. That's where I get on fire because that's the, the spooky spiritual <laughs> area. That I don't want to get it. All for it. And so I love to take people into that place and, and he's doing it with me too. So I, you know, I, people call me an expert or trust in the things that I do, but at the end of the day, I'm still on that journey. I'm just yeah. bringing some people with me. We're we're all a, a work in progress. None of us have actually arrived, right? That's, it's it's absolutely. we continue to grow and evolve, and God continues to shape us. You know, it's funny. I was listening to what you were saying, and it just reminded me of when I was young. My mom used to constantly tell me, "Oh, you you see, you you're you know you're a little minister. You're going to minister to people one day." And I would look at her like, "What is wrong with you, lady? Like, I have no desire. No, thank you." <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then as I got older, it was like, I was going to church constantly. I was going to church on Sundays, on Wednesdays, I'm at Bible study, doing all these things, but I had no desire to be a part of the church. I didn't want to be a part of any of the the politics or anything of behind the scenes. And I would constantly be asked, you know, what, what part of the ministry do you want to serve in? Or what part of the church do you want to serve in? I'm like, mm, outside these walls? No, okay. <laughs> I just always felt like, that wasn't my place. And yeah. then as I started going through my own healing journey and sharing my story and building community and other women were reaching out saying, wow, how much they felt seen, heard and understood by just hearing stories like yours, stories like mine, it created its own community. And then people started saying to me, like, this is your ministry. So now my brain is like now connecting what was said to me <laughs> as a child, like, Oh, okay. So I don't actually have to have a ministry inside of the four walls of a church. This Mm -hmm. is my ministry. I am meant to serve and make impact on the people that I'm connected to through this way. Got it. (laughs) Yes. And, and girl, thank God you got it because so many (laughs) would be like, oh my gosh, if you weren't, you've impacted so many people's lives. You've connected so many people. I believe God is pleased. I really thank do. You. You know? and, and I'm pleased too because thank <laughs> God. And that's the thing people have to realize too. Like we're connected, like you said, and people are dependent on your obedience. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. there's that fear. Sometimes we're so fearful, but sometimes that fearful can become selfish. It mm-hmm. become it can become the God over your life. Where it's like, how dare you? This person is waiting, God is waiting on you to answer that. Because without you, that person can't get free. Yeah. So you have something to get over yourself. Even girl, every time I'm my followers know, I'll sit there and be like, God told me to come on here every day. I don't want to be here. I'm tired. <laughs> I stuck with you. But Jesus, I'm gonna say yes. Cause I want everyone to know, talking about labels, labels and expectations, that even when 
That's why God is always encouraging his people. Fear not. Be of good courage. Walk worthy of your calling because he knows we're no good. He knows. <laughs> And it's a blessing when you can get into agreement and actually enjoy what he's doing in your life. Because I'll tell you right now, this devil out here don't want you to walk (laughs) in that space. And so the quicker we realize and you find, okay, well, this person needs me. I need this. I need to be obedient because there's blessings attached to that. You will encourage yourself and then you will see the fruit of it. And that's why I, I know I, it is a fight every day to do right and to walk in purpose. Yeah. And I, I I celebrate you for doing that because if anyone I know who knows how to be resilient <laughs> and walk through some storms <laughs> and come out like gold, <laughs> it's me. I feel like I feel like a part of me, I, I kind of sabotaged myself where I used to so okay, so I have this thing about sharing my wounds where I feel like it's, it is my duty. It's because it's not just about me. It is my duty to share, to help other people get to where they need to get to. But I struggle with sharing it as I'm going through it. So it's, I prefer to share my scars, not my open wounds. So it's, it's like, I have to work through first, (laughs) let God mold (laughs) so that I get some understanding and then come out and, and share But I feel like when I've done that in the past, because I still, like you said, even when I don't want to, I was still consistent. I I could be going through hell and people have no clue because I'm still consistent on social. I'm still consistent with the podcast. That's God. That's not me. Mm -hmm. But then in doing so, people are like, oh, well, you've made it look so easy. So now through the podcast, especially, I've been doing my best to be very clear that this ain't easy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is not me. This is every day. This is death of the ego. This is like, okay, this is not about me today. Do I want to get dressed up and put on makeup? No, I would like to put on my head wrap and go lie on the couch and watch Netflix. <laughs> like, and you, by the hand, I'll roll up at the camera with the bonnet on if I have to. My like, guys, don't judge me. I, I, I couldn't do it, but I'm here. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So what would you say is your superpower? I don't know if this is a superpower. We're going to make it one round right now, (laughs) but it's showing up. It's getting up again. I say that because I, I celebrated a best friend's birthday the other day. And she said to me, Alicia, and I had to sit there and say, you know what? It's true. You know, she's like, you always get up. And I started to think that like anytime something's happened, I want love peace, freedom so bad that even bound, I would still get up. Like you, I don't care if Goliath comes and pushes me down. Like I won't be like, okay, I'm still going to get up. Like, (laughs) I don't know how, but I can't, I cannot accept that I will be defeated by my enemies. Mm Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I can cry. I can be down for a day. But I'm telling you, my mother used to say this to me. So, so wise. It, it was, she would allow me to cry for a time. Mm-hmm. But then she would say, and it wasn't like this tough thing. It was just like, okay, you've cried enough today. You're going to go in the bathroom. You're going to wash your face. You're going to eat something. We're going to have a good day today. And I think that's something I don't carry the grudge. I don't carry whatever. But if you push me down, I'm getting up. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to pretend that you didn't push me down. And if you push me down again, I'm still going to get up. Mm-hmm. And it's, I really believe that's by the grace of God. I give him all the glory. But sometimes you got to do that because you felt like staying in the grave. You felt like it, but you have to prove to yourself that you're still alive. Mm-hmm. And I love saying this, out of the ashes, we rise. Mm -hmm. Even when they tear you down, they're burnt down. You feel like nothing. God, the Bible says it like this. It's so powerful. He said, the same spirit that brought Jesus up from the dead is in you. Mm -hmm. I would say that's my superpower. Mm -hmm. I know God gave it to me, but I've seen it in work and it impresses me every time to the point where I'm like, Alicia, proud of you, man. Yes. I am proud of you too. Like when when I asked you what your superpower was, when you first started, I guess, explaining and talking about what your friend sees in you, like at first, 
the word consistency came to me because I've seen you be very consistent, but then it went to perseverance. And then the more that you got into describing it, I was like, no, 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 that is the definition of resilience, your ability to get back up every time you were knocked down. That's resilience. You have continually strengthened your resilience muscle till now. It's like bodybuilder strength. Like. <laughs> It's so I just laugh. I laugh even Katie, because even like sometimes my friends watch because they've seen the journey too, and they're like Alicia. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, not doing that. Okay, let's move on to this. And they're like, there was a time where you would you would I would be stuck, and even if I did get up, it might take longer. But now, like you said, that muscle has been strengthened, and I'm like, okay, that was that. We got to move on. There's things to do. And, and God's, I'm on a time sensitive assignment. Amen. So let's keep going, you know? Yes. Yeah, listen, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting goosebumps and then I'm like, oh yeah, time sensitive. I forgot we're recording a podcast. Okay. So, <laughs> Cause you and I could talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we go to the final segment of the show, I want you to tell people where they can stay connected with you online, where they can learn more from you and about you. Well, firstly, make sure you go on to alishabreeze.com, okay? A-L-I-C-I-A-B-R-E-E-Z-E, just in case, you know, dot com. Make sure you stay connected to my website because that's where all information flows. You can subscribe to that. If anything happens in these social media streets, that means that's where you'll find me, okay? So make sure you subscribe to that. Under the same name, Alicia Breeze, you can find me on YouTube, on Instagram. It's it's Alicia Breeze. And yeah, you can always hit me up with an email at, at aliciabreeze.com. So everything's <laughs> there. And I think that's about it. it I'm, I'm trying to manage. I can't be on everything because it's not sustainable for me. And I'm on Facebook too, if you like. So you can find awesome. me all through the same name. I will have all of your links in the detailed section so they can just click and connect with you. They don't have to search too far. Awesome. Awesome. So for the final segment of the show, kind of like a rapid fire, you can answer one word, one sentence. You and I are both kind of rebels, so we may have to <laughs> extend those answers and unpack a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know me so well, McKinney. <laughs> all right. Okay. If you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would it say and why? Okay. It would say, this is my hashtag these days, okay? It would be the White House. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. That's a hard one. But it would say, get God, get free. Mm. That's it. Love it. Get God, get free. Love That's it. my new thing I'm on right now. But I say in front of the White House because it would startle people. <laughs> and when it says it's the land of the free, I don't know. That can be argued. Mm-hmm. And I, everyone know, get God, get free. And my face would be there. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Uh, what's one thing you forgive yourself for? Mm, not trusting my inner voice. Mm-hmm. I realized pretty much when I reflect on any mistake, like major life choice that went to, it was just fear, like not listening, like thinking pleasing others would be better than, you know, standing with what I believed. I didn't have, I didn't have that. I didn't have that for a very long time. I didn't have that probably till I was about maybe really like five years ago, maybe three years ago. Maybe when I started this, <laughs> like, really, like, you know, you think you do, but I think this chapter of my life is so demonstratively different now. Mm. So I take time, prayer, all that stuff. Oh my gosh, that's a serious question. Sorry, I was going on. <laughs> <laughs> they are meant to be reflective. Yes, <laughs> do what it's meant to do. <laughs> okay. What have you become better at saying no to in the last five years? And that could be distractions, invitations, family. No. Oh, okay. No to disrespect. Woo! Like, I know that's kind of like an umbrella of things, but I mean, it like, mm, nobody gets a blind. Nobody, <laughs> nobody gets a free ride with that one. And, you know, I feel like, I, I I know that's like a very typical thing, especially in our computer. They disrespect me. They disrespect me. Right. But I don't mean like, I mean, where, you know, that you're showing up a hundred, you love that person 
and you're you affirm that person and the and and there's a difference between someone making a mistake you know one has to be perfect but not just not respecting the gift that God has placed in front of you not respecting people the resort like whatever it is so it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be a personal thing when i see for someone like wow that person's so blind don't mm-hmm. bring that around me cuz i want to stay clear you know mm-hmm. i don't want your vision of things your distortion your deception affecting how i see the world and how i see my relationship with god and if that i have to just put that aside you know yeah, yeah. so and no to dis- so disrespect and deception. Oh my gosh, I know I had one and deception. <laughs> I would rather, I'm so gangster with that, Makini, that especially as a leader in the body of Christ, I have come to a point where I'm not afraid to tell anybody my flaws. That's mm-hmm. why I thought I'm tired of the deception. Like someone's going to come and say, I saw Alicia, like I go to the parties. I go to the parties and I'm going to get flack. Guess what? You know how many times I've ministered to people in the party? I ask my friends, they're like, wow, I went to a party. I'm going to testify for a second because I want to mess with people's theology. I went to a party the other day and I said, I discerned some of them. This place is going to turn into a strip club just now. Okay. Mm. I guys don't know if I can stay, right? Because it was a nice little lounge. It wasn't even a club, but I just knew it. All of a sudden, McKinney strippers came out the place. Oh, wow. I went up to the strippers. <laughs> Jesus loves them. I listen. I went up to. We were cool. I hugged them. I prayed for them. People thought that's what I talk about: getting God and getting free. Where somebody be like, I can't do that. I was like, they love, like they embraced me. Some girls like, wow, wow. She was so overwhelmed, and then I had to go because mm-hmm. the strippers had to go. But I'm like, nobody is going to stifle what I believe. And if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. Yeah. But I'm not going to sit here and pretend, no, 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 no. I'm going to I'm gonna be 100% real. I hold myself accountable. I know everybody says that now, but I'm try- I don't care if it makes my ego, if I look bad. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That to me is so powerful. I actually love that more than you know, because I used to have this view where it was, and this is where I used to actually get offended when people called me a church girl, because I felt like everyone in the church is there because they're flawed. Everyone is there because they're seeking God. They're seeking truth. They're seeking more and better, but that doesn't make or mean that they are better or the highest. Right. And then they would judge people on the outside. And it's like, they need the support. They need the love. They need the guidance. They need the light too. So part of me feeling like I was never meant to serve inside of the church was because I wanted to show people what God looked like. And it didn't have to be the perfect church girl image. I wanted to show people that you could be real. You could be who you are and still have a close relationship with God. You could still serve God. You could still make an impact with people, but it didn't have to look like the typical church girl way. So when you say that, I love that you go to places and are still able to build your relationship with God and connect people and impact people outside of the walls of a church. And this is what it is. And this is what why we have to know that we are the church. Yeah. Not four walls. You could be sitting in a place that says church on it and you're sitting in the pits of hell. Right. Okay. We know that. <laughs> Listen, it's time. To, it's it's 2023. It's time to get free. It's time for us to break out of certain things because God wants to do a new thing and it's going to spring forth very rapidly. And we have to be able to catch whatever God's trying to do give us. And, and I think if we make ourselves available, like you have, you will see like God is really everywhere. God's God is everywhere. So yes. we mess with people's theology and I'm okay with that because, Love Hey, it. <laughs> it is what it is, man. take it up with God. It's all right. <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, when was the last time you apologized to someone? Um, yesterday. <laughs> I, think I, I apologized to someone yesterday. I'm going to tell you something about me. I think because I've been in a, in a seat where people can't take accountability, I'm very good with taking accountability. I, I believe I've improved massively. I think there was a time when you're in a dynamic that I was from where you beca- you can become very defensive and as part of a defense mechanism, right? So um, I've also learned what an apology really looks like. Mm-hmm. So it's not the same sorry. Mm-hmm. It's about 
it up to the person. There's steps to an apology. So yes. it's making up it up to the person. It's fine. It's, you know, continued consistent effort. It's not going backward. It's going forwards. You might fall sometimes, but again, it's constantly making, taking accountability. And I actually find myself more empowered that way than trying to deflect it onto something else. So yes, I apologized yeah. yesterday and I'll probably apologize for something <laughs> for the next few hours. You never know. I love it. I love it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Last but not least, what do you wish women would do more of? In this climate, and I, 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 I'm going to sound like a church lady right now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like more women have to put God first. Mm-hmm. The scripture says, seek ye the, the kingdom of God and all its right, his righteousness and everything else shall be added unto you. I just believe that we're living in a time where the, there's a lot of moral decay amongst women. And we don't understand how much power and influence we have mm-hmm. when we build up our morale, not for each other, for ourselves and for others around us. Um, when we see the moral decay of a woman, it affects community. Yeah. Okay. It affects nations. Okay. And so I feel like that answer would cover everything else. Mm-hmm. You know? So more women have to, instead of trying to do things, I, I struggle with it too. I'm saying like, I'm like, God, am I really putting first? Am I delusional? Have I been through this road that, that like this road before and I'm going to find myself in trouble. I might not see it yet, but sure enough, I've lived life long enough to <laughs> try that bikini. And it never looks good. So I'm, I, I have enough fear now of God to say, okay, God, I'm going to do it right. And that's a lot of, even with my ministry, the work that I do, it's like, okay, God, let me put you first and you're going to take care of me. And he has, he's blessed me with multiple businesses. Now I'm just telling you now through the process, of just saying, God, I'm going to pray. I'm not going to, not everything is about the algorithm and monetization. Yeah. Okay. Some things are just strictly about God and God will bless you for your obedience. So I, I thank God for that. Amen. I, I thank God for you. Um, thank you, Alicia, for sharing who you are with us today. Thank you for sharing your energy, your truth, your wisdom. I see nothing but an abundance of blessings coming your way. And I am here to like stand in the gap with you and celebrate it all. I am so happy for you. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And it's so good to have somebody who's genuinely happy for you. (laughs) And I celebrate you too. Everything on this podcast this year is going to be amazing for you. I don't know how much higher you can go, but there is. It's not <laughs> raising it. There, the, there's no ceiling. The sky's the limit. And I'm just praying that God takes you and all of your listeners um, together on this journey to greatness and just blessings overflowing for 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to all of you healers out there until next time, subscribe on all platforms. Don't forget to rate the show and leave us a review on Apple Podcast. I want you to let us know what resonated with you from today's episode. What was your aha moment from what Alicia said? What were your gems that you took away from this conversation? You can screenshot the episode and you can tag Alicia at it's Alicia Breeze. You can tag myself at the real McKinney Smith. And I just want to thank each and every one of you that continues to listen each week to help the show globally rank in the top 1.5% of most podcast out there that's almost over 3 million podcasts now so thank you a healthy community is a healing community and a healing community is full of hope because it has seen its own people whether survive and thrive so let's continue to heal her